John chapter 3. Uh, we're carrying on in our series that you may believe, talking about Jesus as the new birth today. Um, it was, I, I, we have this app on our phones called Time Hop. Time Hop goes back every year on that day for what you posted, for what pictures you shared. And we, uh, seven years ago, went on a mission trip. And on the way, way back, Carrie started us and she wasn't feeling that good. A couple days later, she still wasn't any better, so we went to the doctor's office to find out what was going on. And the nurse comes in and says, Mrs. Douglas, I can tell you why you're not feeling that good, why you're a little nauseated, and why you feel like you got a cold. You're pregnant. <laughs> and it was Sam. So with Sam, we had our bags packed early. I think about three or four weeks out, we had our bags packed ready by the door in case he wanted to make an early appearance. With Gray, we just had the stuff sitting there, and we figured we'd get to it when we got a little closer to time, because we were good first parents, uh, waiting for him to decide he wanted to be born, and then one day we had our routine ultrasound, and the doctor does the measurements, and he does the calculations, and he says, this baby looks like he's going to be close to 10 pounds. Do you want to have him tomorrow? And <laughs> Carrie said, yes. So we go to the hospital. We... He's, he comes into the world, and there's such a wonder in seeing that new life, counting the little fingers and toes, and feeling the warm, uh, soft hair, and the little fuzz that's on him, and the snuggles that come with it, the joy and exhausted parents' eyes, the picture opportunities. And then one day, they help you get the baby in a car seat, they get you in the car, and they say bye. And that's it. <laughs> So we drove home from the hospital at 15 miles an hour with the hazard lights on <laughs> because nothing was, was safe enough. But there's such a joy in new birth. There's such a joy when baby Christians are part of a church because it means that the kingdom's growing just in the same way that there's joy when a baby's born because it's a growing family. Uh, there's such a, a, a wonder in the expansion of the kingdom. And that's what we're going to talk about today. John 3 is the, is the, the passage on the new birth. And what we'll, the big idea for this morning is that the new birth gives life to those who trust in him. Jesus as the new birth gives life to those who trust in him. So let's read the first 21 verses of John 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these things, these signs that you do, unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you know its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God." And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness more than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. 
But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the new birth that comes to us through Christ, that you loved us so much that you sent your Son, so that we might be saved and live with you for eternity if we would believe in him. And we thank you for the new life that comes through the Spirit. And I pray that we would be transformed, made more like Christ this morning. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this idea of new birth is a big deal for John. Out of the 18 times that it's used in the Bible, he uses it 12, and most of it's right here. So three things about the new birth. The first thing is that it's the entry into the kingdom. It's the entry into the kingdom. So we open up this chapter, we see an introduction to the man Nicodemus. Who is he? He's, we're told he's a Pharisee. We're told he's a member of the Sanhedrin. He's a ruler of the people with those positions. Also came wealth. So he comes from a wealthy family. He's a man of privilege. Later in John's Gospel, he defends Jesus in chapter 7. And in chapter 19, after the death of Christ... He brings spices and ointments for the body of Jesus. Tradition tells us a couple of different options on what happened to Nicodemus after the resurrection. The first is that he was baptized by Peter and by John, and as a result of becoming a Christian, was expelled from the city of Jerusalem, was fired from his responsibilities as a Pharisee. Another is that he and his family endured extreme persecution and suffering and fell into dire poverty as a result of his faith in Christ. One of the things that we see from church history is that Nicodemus becomes a Christian, which is an incredible testimony of God's grace. So he comes in, he meets with Jesus, there's all the speculation over why it was at night, this happens right after Jesus cleanses the temple. Nicodemus is coming at night so that nobody knows that he's there. It's a private time. This is something that's done in secret so that he can come and find out exactly who Jesus is and what he's doing. Nicodemus also is the first to really recognize that this is someone who's coming from God because he says, look, no one could be doing the things that you're doing unless they were from God. And when he asks Jesus... What do I need to do? Jesus responds with this riddle-like answer. You must be born again. Or you must be born from above. Or you must be reborn. And Nicodemus responds like most of us would if we were told you had to be born again. We'll look at us. We'll look at our moms. We'll look back at us and say, she's five foot one. I'm not quite sure how this works. And that's what Nicodemus does. He looks back and he goes, okay, you know, I'm a teacher of the law. I'm not a real doctor, but I do know that you, you, you don't get to go back to your mom. And Jesus says, no, 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 you're missing the point. Rather than a literal interpretation, what Jesus is doing is he's conveying this is a renewal that's been prophesied for hundreds of years. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I'll give you the heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes, and obey my law. There's something that, John is, that Jesus is alluding to that John records, that this is not a birth that's natural. This is not a birth that's physical. The Holman Commentary talks about the new birth is to become a member of God's family through faith in Jesus Christ. This isn't something that, that we simply assume to be the case. When Sam was born, he was part of our family. There was a legal document that was signed in the hospital that said, this is our child, he's part of our family. We had to file paperwork with the insurance company to make sure that his birth could be paid for. We had to file documents so that he could get a social security card so that we could be put on his birth certificate as his parents. There was a legal sense that he became our child, even though biologically that was already determined. But that's not what we're talking about. This is not a faith that happens just by assumption. This is a faith, this is a membership in God's family and adoption that is initiated by repentance and the desire to lead a new life to the honor and glory of Christ. 
We are attaining a citizenship in the kingdom through the new birth. The new birth is our entry into the kingdom where we are given our citizenship. We become members of God's family. We are now part of the body that God has put together. And so we are assembling into the family whenever someone is born again. Because faith is not biological. You can't pass faith like you can eye color or skin tone. It doesn't work like that. It's also not organic. This is not something that just simply happens that you can just assume or if you work hard enough or do good enough that you can get it. This is something that must be done, as it says in the Holman Commentary, initiated by repentance. This is an entry into the kingdom, and it also originates from the Spirit. What John's doing and what... as he's quoting Jesus in this section, is that he's showing us that our faith, our entry to the kingdom, starts with the Spirit. Starts with the Spirit opening our eyes. Starts with the Spirit giving us the gift of faith. Because apart from the gift of faith, we read and we hear this and we respond like Nicodemus. We're looking at the surface. We're looking in the box. We're looking in the temporal. But with the gift of faith that comes from the Spirit, we're able to see things as they really are. And we're able to see things, and we're able to see them and understand them from a spiritual perspective rather than a temporal one. Because this is the part of our hearts being transformed from within, is the work of the Spirit. Second thing, as we see in verses 9 through 15, this has been part of God's redemptive plan from the beginning. And that's why Jesus, when he tells Nicodemus about the new birth, and Nicodemus doesn't understand, Jesus' response is to say, you're a teacher of the law. You know the book. How are you missing this? This isn't some new revolutionary teaching. This is something that God's been alluding to. God's been preparing his people for. God's been progressively unveiling through the pages of the Old Testament to the point where when Jesus comes, it's the fullness of time from Galatians. It's the fullness of time where now God sends his son to not only to take all of those pieces, all of the illusion, all of the foreshadowing, and bring it out in its fullness, so that it's all obvious, the end of the movie, the end of the story, and he brings it all together and he puts it into one package. So when Jesus shares and Nicodemus doesn't get it, he points back to the Old Testament three different ways. One, he uses the analogy from Ezekiel 37, the resurrection, the bringing back to life of the dry bones, of the skeleton field, the cemetery, the place where the dead bones are. Ezekiel 37, God brings them back to life. God regenerates them. God gives new life to where there was once death. That's what happens to us inside, is that we cross over from death to life. The second one is that he goes to Numbers 21, talks about the lifting of the serpent. So Numbers 21, the people are in rebellion. God sends poisonous snakes through the camp. People are getting bit. They're getting sick. They're dying. Moses, God tells Moses there's a provision for salvation. That there is a serpent hung up, placed on high, for people to look upon and be saved. The image of the curse is going to be the image of their redemption. And in the same way, Jesus says, I'm going to be like the serpent put up in the wilderness. I'm going to be lifted on high, on a cross. And to those who look upon the cross, to those who look upon the Savior, they will be rescued. The third thing, Jeremiah 31, the heart transplant. We have a dead heart. That's why we do organ transplants. We have sick, diseased, dying organs. And they're replaced with vibrant, with alive, with healthy organs. We have a dead heart that must be taken out and replaced with a heart of flesh. It's the same illusion in Ezekiel. 
What's great about Scripture is that God hasn't changed his mind. This is all the unfolding plan of God's revelation, of God's redemptive work, as God, through history, gives us a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. But all from the start of Scripture, there's been one trajectory, one path, and that leads to a cross. The saints in the Old Testament, I believe, were saved by the same gospel that we are. The promise of Messiah, the promise of Christ. They had the promise yet to be revealed. They had the promises made. On the other hand, we have, on this side of the cross, we have the promise delivered. We have the promise that's been delivered. And we are saved by the same promise of God, I believe, that the Old Testament saints were. And in this section, we also see that Jesus acknowledges and appeals to his own eyewitness. Look again there. He says, No one's ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus can speak about heavenly things because he's been there. Jesus can speak on the authority of God because he is God, because he has fellowship with God. Jesus has unique perspective into things because, excuse me, because he is an eyewitness. And if you read through John's Gospel, and if you read through 1 John and, and the rest of John's letters in the New Testament, you see this overwhelming use of the eyewitness. John says in 1 John, and in Jesus says it too, I saw it, I heard it, I touched, and I experienced. It's a confirming compilation of evidence, of witness, of testimony. Not only have we seen it, but we've heard it, we've heard it, we've touched it, we've touched it, we've experienced it. This is a comprehensive witness of who Jesus is. And John is saying, Jesus is saying, and John is quoting it, that Jesus can speak about these heavenly things because he's been there, because he's seen it, because he's touched it, because he's experienced it. And the third thing that we see is that the new birth opens up our eyes to light. John 3.16 is the most quoted, most known Bible verse. Shows up on license plates, shows up on posters at football games, showed up on iBlack for Tim Tebow in the national championship game, shows up everywhere because it's one of the most powerful descriptions of what God has done and who God is like. That That's why it's so popular. That's why it's so incredible. So if you're a Bible circler, you can do this with this, this verse. And if you, I invite you to do it if you are the type that does that. We see a reason and we see a purpose for God's coming, for Jesus' coming. We see the reason is for God so loved. So it's God's love that calls him, that motivates him to come. This isn't a sense of obligation or duty. This is a, this is a mission of love that, calls, that compels Christ to live, to serve, ultimately to suffer and die. It's an act of love. So there's a motivation. There's a reason behind it. second thing that we see is the purpose for Jesus' coming, which is so that those who might believe would not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. The purpose of Jesus' coming was to bring us with him for eternity. Apart from Jesus doing that, we do not have access to heaven. So what happens is we see a mission that's compelled by love, that's motivated, that's driven, that's, per that's reasoned by love. On the other side, we see the purpose, the results, so that we might cross over from death to life. Jesus identifies himself as God's own son, not as a moral teacher, not as a good guy not as an example to follow. He identifies himself in this verse, in this section, as the Son of God, giving him authority, giving him majesty, giving him worship that God deserves, not a man that comes and assumes adoption, assumes sonship, becomes an example for us. 
There's a reason why I don't watch History Channel documentaries. It's because I'm trying to yell at my television less. And especially at Easter because they'll get the talking heads and they'll... I saw a tweet this morning that said 25% of self-professed Christians don't believe in the resurrection. The easy answer to that is 25% of self-professed Christians aren't Christians. <laughs> so we have this, the, the, the identity of, of Jesus as the Son of God... And what we see is that this is more than just a sacrificial lamb. This is more than just a small picture. This is God unveiling his plan of redemption. So his sacrifice is sufficient for the entire world. This isn't just a savior that comes for a, uh, a one-time one period or for a favored group. This is a savior whose death is sufficient for the world, but who's whose blood covers the sin of those who trust in him. His sacrifice is sufficient. His sacrifice is great. His sacrifice declares us to be righteous. I don't have a criminal record. Although at one time, I got a good speeding ticket. Should have gotten more probably, but one time I got one. I got it on my birthday. Of all days to get pulled over, I even had it on my driver's license, July 15th. I thought for sure maybe I'd get a birthday present. Instead, I got an appearance at the most popular address in Memphis, Tennessee, which is not Graceland on Elvis Presley Boulevard. It's 201 Poplar, the jail. And so here I am guilty of going like 51 and a 45 or something like that. And I have to go spend my day at the courthouse so that I can get the ticket taken care of. And I'm standing in line with all kinds of other people who are guilty. None of us were there because we didn't do it. All of us were there because we were guilty. People in front of me that had been held in contempt of court. People behind me that were back on their child support payments. People that had failed to appear. There were felonies. There were misdemeanors. There were speeding tickets. There were all kinds of violations. And every single one of us was guilty. In the eyes of the law, I was looking at having my insurance rate go up. I was looking at having points on the license because I was guilty. So I spend my day waiting at 201 until I finally make my way into the courtroom, walk up to the judge. The judge looks at me and says, are you Mr. Douglas? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, do you know why you're here? I said, yes. She said, okay, your record's expunged. And she signed off the ticket, handed it back to me, and in one signature, one action, I was innocent in the eyes of the state of Tennessee. I was innocent of the crime. Did I do it? Yeah, but the judge had declared me righteous. That is what God does with us. So that when he looks at us, he does not see our guilt. He sees the innocence of Christ. We also see that he comes not just for one people, but he comes for the nations to be grafted in. That's what Easter is so special. And as we saw this morning, the tragedy in Egypt, as our brothers in Christ were bombed gathering for Palm Sunday, every, every Sunday, believers from every tribe, every tongue, every nation are gathering together to worship Christ, who died not just for white middle-class America, but who died for those in other nations, those of other languages, those of other backgrounds, to graft them in to the kingdom of God. He comes and divides truth from error. He preaches with authority because he's the author of Scripture. And John closes with this analogy of light, that the new birth opens up our, idea, our eyes to light. So John 3.16 we see that that is our entry, that is, the, that is the purpose of God's coming, is to bring us from death to life, to open our eyes up to the light. A few weeks ago, I sat on the couch, and Carrie walked up and said, how much do you love me? Before you think that's sentimental, that's what she asks when she wants me to do something. <laughs> so I look up and say, what you need, hon? She said, need something out of the fridge in the garage. I'm scared, I thought I saw something move. I said, okay, I'll go get it. So I get my shoes on, and I open, I open up the door, flip the light on, and cockroaches that cast shadows scatter throughout my garage. Now, apparently that's normal down here. No one thinks that's creepy but us, that these things are this big, and they scurry through the garage. Someone told me today about grasshoppers that get this big. We really do live in Jurassic Park. But <laughs> the darkness, things can hide. And in the darkness... Stuff can disappear. 
And in the darkness, we see that things aren't exposed. But when the light is turned on, there's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to escape. The light causes us to see everything. And what we are laid bare before us is the reality of what's really there. Whether it's roaches, whether it's a sinful heart, whether it's dirtiness or a closet sin or whatever it might be. When the light is exposed onto that, it shows the reality for what is truly there. And we have to come to grips with who we are and what we are. But the other thing the light does is the light points the way. Not only does light expose, but light gives direction. If you've ever been lost, you, in the woods especially, you know the value of a flashlight. You know the value of what it means to have a light to orient yourself with, to have a lighthouse that can show you where the rocks are, to show you where safe harbor is. When we lived in Memphis, I first moved there, um, when we got in, after we got engaged, I got lost on my way home because uh, the roads were designed by someone that moved street signs. And I remember the, the, we, were, we lived fairly close to Bellevue Baptist, um, giant church, and they had some guy with a bunch of money that donated these three really tall crosses and the spotlights that go with it. And so you can quite literally see this searchlight for miles away. And so I oriented myself to get back home when I found where the searchlight was. That's what light does. Light exposes, but light also directs. And the gospel of Christ not only exposes us for who we are, but it puts it on display on the cross. And then that cross is on display so that we are reminded visually, so that we are reminded publicly that on the cross, our sin was crucified with Christ. But also, Christ provides the light. Christ shows us the way. The gospel points us in the direction we're supposed to go. And that's what we see about this new birth, is that we are able to see the light. Three application points, and then we'll sing. <clears throat> First thing was we need to love like God loves. God sent his son for the world, not just for a particular class of people. Not just for middle class, not just for white, not just for people that look like us. He has a love for the lost, for the least, for the misfits, for the self-deceived. The question is, do we have that same love for those that God loves? Do we love like Christ? Second thing, shine like Jesus shines. When we are held up and we are reflected back like a mirror, do people see Christ in us? Do we reflect Christ with how we live, with how we act, with how we treat others, with how we conduct our business, or do we reflect something else? Do we shine back Jesus to those that are watching? And the third thing, we need to tell others the truth. Jesus doesn't leave a side option. Sometimes in our houses, we have the front door, and then we have the back door, and then we have a hidden key if all else fails. Other times, there's the rock. Sometimes there's an entry that's a side way into the house or a side way into work. Most of us have had those before. Jesus doesn't give any other options. He says, if you want to see heaven, you must be born again. There is one path. There is one way. Every other way leads to destruction. Every other way leads to a Christless eternity. Every other way leads away from safety and into danger. And as Christians, as believers, as those who have seen the light, those that have the light, those that have the direction, we have an obligation out of love, out of concern, out of compassion for those around us to tell them the truth. What a horror it would be if we saw the truck coming and we did nothing about it. As Christians, we have the hope. We have the message. And we have an obligation out of love to tell the truth. To tell people about Jesus. And that's what we're leading into for Easter. That's where we're headed next week. As we sing, we're going to sing. It's an old song. 
I surrender all. And I, I want this, I'd love for this to be our prayer. That we really surrender all. This isn't a song where we say, we sing, I surrender some, I surrender most, I surrender much, I surrender nearly. It's a song of I surrender all. See, entry into the kingdom means that we are yielding our rights for our own agenda. And we are submitting ourselves to the lordship of Christ, to the direction of Christ, to the leadership of Christ. And we are surrendering. We are handing over our arms. We are handing over our agenda. We are handing over our prerogative. And we're telling him, take and lead, and I'll follow wherever you take me. I heard it once before that it's like you can't be a, a, a passenger seat rider in the car if, if Jesus is going to drive because, or a backseat driver because we're always going to be looking, we're always going to be glancing, we're always going to be offering our input or our suggestions like we can suggest what God's, what our best is to God. Instead, the picture is us handing the keys to Jesus, climbing in the trunk, closing the door and saying, take it wherever you want to go and I'll follow you there. That's what it means to surrender all. And let's pray that this morning and let's sing this as our prayer. And if you need to make something public, I'll be down here to receive you. I'll be glad to talk to you about it. Palm Sunday is so special for me. It's the anniversary of my baptism, Palm Sunday, 1999. And I would love the opportunity to share and to, and to celebrate what God's doing in your life on a day that's really special for me. And if you need to do something private, this is your time to do it as well. So let's pray and we'll sing, I surrender all. Father, as we come to the, to the time where we must depart, I pray that we would reflect this song as a prayer to you. That all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. And I surrender all. You are our Lord and you have called us to follow you. So I pray that we would love like you love, shine like you shine that we would, out of our compassion for those around us, tell them about Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.